Good morning. We're going to sing Now Thank We All Our God, but first we're going to hear the story behind the song. Okay, Now Thank We All Our God. An old English preacher once said, a grateful mind is a great mind, and the Bible agrees. There are 138 passages of scripture on the subject of Thanksgiving, and some of them are powerfully worded. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 adds, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Unfortunately, few hymns are devoted exclusively to thanking God. Among the small, hand, rich handful we do have is Now Think We All Are God, the German Christians sing this hymn like Americans believers sing the, do the doxology, yet it's loved on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world. It was written by Martin Reinhardt, a Lutheran pastor in the little village of Eilenburg, Saxony. He grew up as the son of a poor coppersmith, felt called to the ministry, and after his theological training began his pastoral work just as the Thirty Year War was raging throughout Germany. Floods of refugees streamed into the walled city of Illenburg. It was the most desperate of times. The Swedish army encompassed the city gates and inside the walls there was nothing but plague, famine, and fear. 800 homes were destroyed and people began dying in increasing numbers. There was a tremendous strain on the pastors who expended all of their strength in preaching the gospel, caring for the sick and dying, and burying the dead. After One after another, the pastors themselves took ill and perished, uh, until at last only Martin Reichardt was left. Some days he conducted as many as 50 funerals. Finally, the Swedes demanded a huge ransom. It was Martin Reinkart who led who left the safety of the city walls to negotiate with the enemy, and he did it with such courage and faith that there were, just as the conclusion of hostilities and the per a period of suffering ended, Reinhardt, knowing there had been no healing without thanksgiving, composed this hymn for the survivors of Eilenburg. It has been sung around the world ever since. Now think we all are God, with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things have done, and who in the world rejoices.
Children are dismissed for junior church. I'm always afraid to kind of put this on while I'm sitting down there because I'm singing. I don't want them to play a joke on me back at the sound thing and like turn the volume up. <coughs> Good week, bad week, indifferent week, normal week. Um, so if you remember, last time I spoke, we were looking in Kings. We're going to be in Kings again today. So if you want to find, I guess, uh, 1 Kings chapter um, 19, we're going to start there. We're going to look at a few different passages, but that'll be the place we'll start. And if you remember last time, um, I had been looking into the lives of Elijah and Elisha, and just reading through some of the events of their life, we're going to kind of continue through that and focus a little bit on um, how Elisha was called into service today. And part of that is going to be, we're going to be looking at Elijah as well. And uh, just to recap a little bit, last, last time I spoke, we we had three kings who went to battle, and they didn't seek the Lord to, to, to start off their, their campaign to win the war. And through finding themselves in trouble, they finally decided, let's go seek Elisha's help and see what the Lord says for us. And, and Elisha kind of grounded them, brought them back to where they should be, and the Lord provided for their victory. Um, so a, a, as we think about that, we're going to kind of kind of go back in history to see how Elisha was called to be able to do things like help those three kings out to provide victory for them. And as we think about that today, I'm going to be using Elijah and Elisha. And I know there's going to be probably a handful of times today where I'm going to be speaking, thinking I'm talking to Elijah, when it's actually Elisha and vice versa because their names are so similar. So when that happens, I apologize in advance for that. Hopefully you can just keep that straight. Um, the thing that I do to try to keep that straight in my mind is when I think of Elijah, Elijah has the J in his name, and Elisha has the S in his name. J comes before the S. Elijah came before Elisha. That's how I use that to try to keep that straight in my mind. But again, I know I'm probably going to interchange those inadvertently today, so I apologize for that. Uh, before we look into God's word, let's, let's stop for a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here. We pray, Father, as we open up your word and we read it, that your spirit would just have a free course to come into our hearts and our minds today, to understand your word, to see how it applies to us. More importantly, Father, that we would not just know and have an intellect about what that means, but it would be able to be applied as we leave this building today to further your kingdom. <clears throat> Father, we just commit it to you. We pray that in my weakness, your words would go out with boldness and strength. And Father, we would be encouraged from being here this morning. Lord, we pray all of these things now in your name. Amen. Okay, um, let's read. Starting at chapter 19 of 1 Kings. And I'm going to start at verse 15. It says, The Lord said to him, and him being Elijah, the older, the first person of the two guys, he replied, oh, excuse me, the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus, where you, when you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Jephat, from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. So this is the very first call that we see Elisha being mentioned. God calls Elisha, God calls Elijah to do some anointing here. He's asking him to go to a couple kings. You're going to anoint them as king. And I also want you to go to Elisha and anoint him 
at some point to succeed you and step in as a prophet. So we see that Elijah is called to go to anoint Elisha, who is going to take over for his place. And when you think about anointing in the Bible, the anointing that it talks about in the Bible is used for four different things. The first thing, they would anoint things to make oneself beautiful. I probably should get some anointing for my life because I probably need that a little bit to make myself a little bit more beautiful. Um, it was also used to promote healing. They would anoint people for healing. It would also be used to anoint a body to prepare it for burial. And in like the case that we're thinking about here today, the fourth thing, it was to anoint an object or a person for the service of God's work. So we're going to see how Elisha goes through this process to be anointed, to be used for God's service. So history, to get us kind of thinking a little bit this morning. The story of Elijah and Elisha has this theme that we're going to look at. Has taken, it will be taking place approximately 150 years after King David was alive. So that gives us a little bit of a time frame of, of what this might look like as far as uh, the history of Israel. Um, during their lifespan, the two of them, there were approximately 17 kings that came into power, both in the northern and southern kingdoms during this time. So there was some influence for many uh, kings who were in power that they had uh, the ability to either interact with in a positive way or, again, in a negative way. And we can see through history how those kings would have been good kings or bad kings. We're not going to really look at that today. Um, Elijah, speaking of Elijah, Elijah was approximately 15 years older than Elisha. Elijah, his first call to service when he was about 23 years old. And Elijah, he served as a prophet for approximately 35 years. Elijah was one of two people in the Bible who never faced death. And of course, Enoch being the other one. We're going to look a little bit about what that looked like today also. And Elijah, he was about 58 years old when he was taken up into heaven. Now, Elisha, again, the younger Elisha, his name means God is salvation. Elisha was about 20 years old when he was called to be a prophet. And Elisha served in that capacity for about 70 years. And it's interesting as you think, and we're going to look at in, in some text today, how one of Elisha's requests was to have a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And it's a, it's. I don't think ironic, but I think purposely done this way. When you thought about Elijah serving 35 years, Elisha served 70 years, double time of what Elijah did. Part of possibly that double portion of what God provided. Elisha died at the age of 90, so he lived a pretty long life. And Elijah served as an assistant for about 23 years, and that's going to be part of our story today, that after Elisha is drawn to Elijah and anointed, he's going to be his helper for about 23 years. And Elisha was about 43 when Elijah was taken up into heaven. Back to our text. Hopefully that gives us a little bit of a background and history lesson where we're picking up reading today. I want you to skip to verse 19 of chapter of First Kings chapter 19. And this is the call of Elisha. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Jephat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. You see that Elisha, Elisha he was a farmer. He was working for his family on the farm, plowing the field. He wasn't part of royalty. He wasn't part of any special dispensation, but kind of, I guess, an ordinary guy who's going to be anointed for God's work. Continuing on, Elijah went up. Um, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now it's interesting. This cloak, as I did a little bit of research in my study, the cloak that a prophet would wear had a special symbol associated with it. It was known as this cloak or his mantle. And a lot of times we say 
He took the mantle and placed it on him, and then he took the mantle and ran with it. You get this picture that Elijah is taking off his cloak, his mantle, putting it upon Elisha, part of that anointing process, kind of passing the torch to him. At some point, Elisha, you're going to take over and be part of this. And most people at the time would have recognized what a prophet wore with that cloak or that mantle that would have distinguished them in that certain way. So it wouldn't have been something that everybody who would have seen this would have had no clue what was going on. It would have meant something to them that they understood that Elisha was probably being commissioned at this point. Continuing reading. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Or that might read, just remember what I just did for you or did to you with that idea of putting that mantle, that cloak on you. So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. So for about 23 years, we're going to see that Elisha served Elijah as his attendant. And there's not a lot of information that is talked about in that 23 years. We don't have a ton that we can glean from that and learn about it. So as we look at this initial part of Elisha's calling, his commissioning, his anointing to head forward as being a prophet, what can we learn from that? First off, I, I look at this and I see that there was no indecision on Elisha's part. After the mantle was passed to him, put on his shoulders, he immediately stopped plowing, understood what was happening, and went to complete the task. Not only was there no indecision, I think it's so interesting that he got rid of the thing that he was doing permanently. He took the oxen, he slaughtered them, killed them, he took the plow that he was using, built it for an altar, and he cooked that meat on it. There was no temptation for him two years down the road to think, I need to go back where I was at. This isn't working out for me. He decided, I'm getting rid of this thing that I was doing, I'm moving forward, and I am no longer going to have the temptation to go back and pick up where I was. I'm going to work for the Lord in his service. I'm not turning back. Again, for about 23 years, Elisha was Elijah's right-hand man. I can imagine only the things that he would have learned during these 23 years. If we would previously look at Elijah's life, we could see many instances where God used him in mighty ways to do amazing things. Again, I can only imagine the types of situations that they found themselves in where he was able to see God faithful. How does that encourage us this morning? How can we take from what we're reading with Elisha giving up what he had, dropping everything, no decision, getting rid of the thing that he may wanted to turn back to when he was discouraged? What can we learn from that today? How can we apply that into our lives and be encouraged to move forward in God's plan? I pray the Spirit speaks to you to understand, to feel where it is that God is leading us, not only individually, me individually, you individually, but collectively as a church. How does that move in our hearts and our minds to encourage us to look forward, to see God's plan, to work in that plan, to let that plan guide and direct us and have no afterthought of, I can't do this. I'm going to go back and do what I did before. God has something for us. We're going to fast forward 23 years because there's not a ton of information of what happened during this time. If you turn over to 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to pick up reading there. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, we're going to start seeing a transition that's going to occur. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. 
Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? And this, this um, company of prophets, it was almost like there were schools of prophets in certain cities. And so this little school of prophets apparently knew what was going to happen. It was kind of like the, the monkey in the room. Everyone knew this was Elijah's last day. Even Elisha knows that. We're going to read that in the text. And so they're like, you know, I can just see this happening. Hey, hey, Elisha, why don't you come over here? Do you know they're going to be taking from you today, Elijah, your master? Kind of the monkey in the room. Nobody wants to speak up and say it. Let's continue reading. Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Verse 4, then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives. And as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Almost you get this sense that they're just, they're just prompting and prodding, like, do you know this? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Stop here for just a second. There's almost these three tests that Elijah is getting to the point. Right at the end, Elisha, are you really ready for some service? Stay here. Don't come with me. And what's Elisha's response? As surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as you are alive, I am going to stay with you. I want to learn more. I want to be a part of your life. And I'm going to see where the Lord is leading us. Verse 7. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, remember the cloak, the same cloak, the mantle, the thing that showed that he was a prophet. He took the cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you for I am, before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it, where now is the Lord. The water with it. Where, sorry, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed the mantle was passed, the torch passed, Elijah is gone, Elisha's taking over. As I studied a little bit about this, and interesting as they traveled between these cities, I wanted to, to figure out how far were they actually going in this, sounds like a one day's time, may have been more than that, I don't know, that's not necessarily relevant. But uh, interestingly enough, as I, as I, as I looked at this, it, the, the, the distance they would have traveled throughout this day would have probably been close to 40 miles if we would add all that totally up. But one of the other interesting things that I found is I don't think it was an accident that Elijah took Elisha to these three cities. I think these three cities were very prominent uh, places in Israel's history. And I think this was just one more learning lesson that Elijah was giving to Elisha. 
It starts out that they're starting in Gilgal, and if we think about Gilgal, if you remember, you may not remember, you may remember. I didn't remember. That's why as I studied this, it was like, wow, this is really cool. In Joshua 4, verses 19 through 24, it says, On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal. Now, this was just after the children of Israel crossed that Jordan River. Similarly, how the waters parted in our story today, they crossed over to the promised land, and they finally had arrived. It says, they camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho, and Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan River before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done at the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. The next chapter in Joshua, it also talks about the fact that in Gilgal, in this, in this city, was the, the young men who crossed over in the Jordan into the Promised Land that as they were traveling in the wilderness, they were not circumcised. And so Joshua orders all of them to be circumcised, kind of the clean cutting away and starting afresh anew. This first place that they camped, and this, this idea of them starting over was a new page that was being turned. And as I thought about that, it surely may have reminded Elisha, that a new page is being turned. We're starting fresh. There's going to be something new happening here. And I'm sure that encouraged Elisha as he thought about his master being taken away, and now he is going to be starting fresh. What does that mean for us today? How does that look for us? It makes me stop and think that today is the day, starting fresh and new. If we find ourselves bogged down and slowed down and just feeling like there's not much going on in our lives spiritually, Today is the day to start something new. We have the ability to turn that page, start fresh, and move forward. From Gilgal, they went to Bethel. And if you remember anything about Bethel, Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Doesn't seem too comfortable having a stone for a pillow. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offerings. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I, will, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took a stone that he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. So he renamed the city, the house of God in the stairway to heaven. This was the city, oftentimes, where the Ark of the Covenant would be, and they would come to that city to inquire of God. For Elisha, this probably would have been a reminder to him that at any time he's able to approach God, to come to him, and to get guidance and wisdom in his service. Again, I don't think it was accidental that they went to these cities. And again, I think, what does that mean for us today? We have a God that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, any time we have the ability to approach him to seek wisdom, to seek guidance, to gain comfort, to gain encouragement, to express joy. 24 hours a day, a stairway we have tied to heaven. Off to Jericho, the city of Jericho. Everyone remember, the walls came tumbling down as we think through Sunday school when we heard about Jericho. 
Joshua 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. This was going to be the first battle that the Israelites were going to fight after they crossed into the promised land. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Amazing. Picture this. This guy with this sword drawn. Joshua going, are you for us or against us? You know what, Joshua? I'm neither for you nor against you, but I'm from the army of the Lord. I'm in control now. What was Joshua's reaction? Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for this place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. Remember, they hold themselves up. They were not going to give in. The big walls, they didn't want to come in or out because they knew Israel was coming to attack them. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have your priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Push yourself in this place of Joshua and the warriors who are going to try to go fight this. We're going to do what? We're just marching around the city walls? How's how are we going to conquer the city? It took faith on the part of them doing this and understanding that. And as they traveled to Jericho, Elijah and Elisha, I wonder if some of the ruins were still standing there. And if Elisha saw that and thought, as the Lord lives and as I take over and become the prophet that God is calling me to be, what does my faith look like that I have to trust in God to accomplish? What kind of faith walk do I need to have like the people did as they attacked Jericho. They literally had to walk by faith as they took down that city. Again, for Elisha, sorry, for yes, for Elisha, this would have been a good reminder that God was in control to trust him, to rely on him for all things big and small. As he thought about becoming the prophet that he was to be, he had to trust in God and have the faith for doing that. And again, for us today, what does that mean for us? As we walk our faith journey, God is calling us to be faithful, to trust him, to let those walls tumble down of the obstacles that are in our way and that we face on a daily basis. God wants to test our faith, apply that faith, and to tumble those walls down. So off they go, back to the Jordan, and miraculously using the mantle, the cloak, to part the waters. We can see then how the story kind of ends up as they're being walking along together. The chariots of fire, horses of fire, come down, scoop up Elijah, and off he goes. Kind of a strange feeling I can only imagine that Elisha must have felt at that point. I try to put myself in that situation and understand the 23 years of helping out and being a part of service, and now the mantle is squarely on me. It says the cloak was left, he took it, and he went. And as he parted the waters going back, I'm sure it was a bolstering sign to him that he was now next in line, taking up the mantle and carrying on for God. What do we do with this story for our lives today? How do we let this impact us and change us and motivate us and bring us into line with where Christ has us? Are we wanting to forget the past, move forward in God's plan as the children of Israel did when they went to Gilgal? Is God calling us to have direct contact with him, seek him out, Lord, what do you want for me in my life with that stairway that is connected to heaven like Jacob 
in his dream had. Is God calling us to live out our faith and walk in that faith in a positive way to accomplish kingdom purposes for him? I believe he is. I don't just believe that. I know that because I feel it in my life. I hope you feel that in your life. I hope as a church body, we know what that looks like and we're able to move forward in God's plan. As he commissioned Elisha for his service, we're going to have opportunity, hopefully, to look at some more of those events through history. But I would encourage us individually, collectively, let's move forward in God's plan. Let's let him teach us, motivate us, and direct us. I pray that God blesses the word this morning.